Uh, I have about 20 minutes or so, um, and then we're going to have um, a discussion. What I'd like to talk about today is where we've got to in the great debate about the future of decoupling uh, between China and the United States. And the reason I want to engage this subject uh, is because there's too much loose talk about decoupling uh, around this country, frankly, in China as well, and in many parts of the world. Uh, the Chinese term tuogo uh, really wasn't uh, used uh, much uh, in the Chinese domestic political debate until a year or so ago, nor was it used much here in the United States. I did a little bit of research. The uh, first time that the word decoupling was used to describe the US-China relationship uh, was in fact in May last year. Uh, and then as of August, uh, Steve Bannon took it up uh, as uh, a way to describe not just what he thought might be happening, but what he thought should happen between China and the United States, comprehensive economic decoupling. Uh, I do not share Mr. Bannon's view. Uh, but the point of emphasising the chronology of this is to say this is a very recent addition to the language about the US-China relationship and, in my own judgement, a very dangerous and imprecise addition to the language about the US-China relationship. I've been in politics and diplomacy long enough to know that in foreign policy, uh, words are bullets. In foreign policy, words are bullets. They actually mean things. <laughs> And if you keep chanting the mantra that these two countries and economies are decoupling, there is a grave danger that you start to create self-fulfilling prophecies. And part of my reason for wishing to address this today here in Palo Alto and the last several days elsewhere on the um, West Coast and more broadly in the international debate is I do not think the facts stack up to support the proposition that these two economies are in the process of comprehensive decoupling. If you think about it, where have we got to over the last 40 years? <clears throat> uh, I am old enough and ugly enough, but not quite as old as uh, Ken would have you believe. <laughs> the, um, uh, I'm simply a product of the Mesolithic period, uh, whereas uh, Ken is a hard and fast... <laughs> Paleolith. <clears throat> but back in the Mesolithic period when I started studying Chinese, uh, the uh, People's Republic of China had just emerged from the Cultural Revolution. When I went to live in China in the early 80s, uh, you had two choices. You could wear blue or green, or you could wear green or blue, <clears throat> or blue and green. Uh, but that was it. And uh, there was no Chinese private sector. <clears throat> Everyone's uh, jobs were allocated by central organisation departments of every unit. Um, on top of that, very few, if any, Chinese students went abroad to study. Very few. And I look across the span of that last 40 years, uh, uh, since uh, I arrived at the Australian National University as a junior woodchuck trying to learn Chinese. Um, then uh, it has been a remarkable set of changes, a remarkable period of, let's call it, engagement between two countries and economies and societies, which prior to that didn't know a lot about each other, to be quite honest. They did in the years prior to 1949, but not at a mass scale. Uh, but I've got to say in the period 79 to the present, this has been a comprehensive period of engagement. So when I see literally hundreds of Chinese students rolling around the universities of the United States or in my own country, Australia, or at Oxford, it's just kind of normal. 40 years ago, it was abnormal. When I see the same happening in capital markets, when I see the same happening in investment markets, when I see the same happening in the trade in goods and services, this pattern and density of engagement is now normal. Only a generation ago, it was totally abnormal. And so the proposition we need to confront here is... Uh, those seeking to unravel this relationship, um, be careful what you wish for in terms of known consequences and unintended consequences because we have come a very long way in that period of time. And I would argue to the benefit of all and not just the two countries but the wider global economy as well. People often equally loosely talk about the beginnings of a new Cold War between the United States and the People's Republic of China. Those 
folk also, like Mr Bannon, need to reread their history. What was it about the Cold War? What were its defining characteristics? Number one, you had a fundamental ideological chasm between the then Soviet Union and the United States in every department, including economic theory. That's no longer the case. There are differences, but it's not a uh, no-holds-barred ideological struggle to the bitter end. Number two, uh, in the days of that Cold War, there was zero economic engagement between the Soviet Union and, China, and uh, the United States. Zero. Now we have uh, China uh, as America's third largest trading partner after the two NAFTA economies, Mexico and Canada. And of course, the United States is China's uh, largest trading partner. And so the whole idea that um, this bears some parallel or, or resonance with uh, what unfolded in the Cold War is frankly just analytically imprecise. Thirdly, in the days of the Cold War, the Soviet Union and the United States were fighting physical proxy wars through third country armies uh, and armed forces right across Latin America, Africa and elsewhere. And that's not happening either. So when we start using loose language like a new Cold War, loose language like decoupling, I would urge everyone to start being more precise about what actually <clears throat> we mean because that is not the current reality. And the only danger is if we start rolling out this language with gay abandon and believe that somehow it's useful to the current debate, that in fact it can contribute to constructing those realities over time. If, for example, one side convinces the other in the China-US relationship that decoupling is unfolding, what happens? Contingency plans are prepared. As a consequence of that, they can be operationalised because of fear that this, in fact, is what's going, to, what's going to unfold. And what happens then is that you start to create the reality, uh, which those of us who have uh, worked hard with this relationship over many decades have sought to avoid. Of course, my saying all the above is one thing. How do you establish the proposition as a matter of fact uh, on the other? Let's look briefly in the time that we've got available at just six areas. One is trade. Second is uh, foreign direct investment. The third is tech. Uh, the fourth is capital markets. The fifth is currency. And the sixth is you and me, talent. Well, you, not me. <laughs> and, uh, oh, and Ken. So, um, <laughs> And the argument I'm going to advance... Uh, in these areas is that at best, from a decouplist point of view, it's a very mixed picture, a very mixed picture indeed. Far from being this comprehensive unravelling of the totality of the relationship, I just do not see it actually empirically being sustained. Let's look at the trade war. OK, it's been rampaging now for 18 months. We've had one level of tariff imposed after another by the Trump administration, retaliatory tariffs by the Chinese side, so that a large part of the traded sector between the two countries is now covered by tariffs, with the risk of a further tranche of tariffs covering the remainder of the traded relationship to be imposed on the 15th of December. Now, I intend to push to one side uh, for the purposes of this discussion about decoupling, the rights and wrongs of the respective positions of each side in the overall trade war. That's a separate seminar. We can go into that if you want to in Q&A. But the bottom line is uh, the uh, decision by the two governments following the uh, meeting in the last month or so between Vice Premier Liu He and uh, US uh, Trade Representative Lighthizer in Washington uh, is that we have set in motion a set of arrangements which is about to bring about a phase one deal for the conclusion of a number, but not all, of the issues associated with the trade war. Uh, President Trump, it's now announced, will be speaking to the Economic Club in New York next Tuesday. His subject will be US-China relation, economic relations. I doubt that he's convening uh, that gathering just for the fun of it. 
I, I expect that what he'll be doing when the, he meets uh, with uh, the uh, great and the good and the not so good in New York uh, next Tuesday will be to announce or at least put his spin on a phase one deal. Uh, the fact that both governments are currently actively discussing and negotiating wh what the venue should be for the signing of a phase, phase one deal suggests to me that we are very, very close indeed. The remit of a phase one deal is a separate matter. <clears throat> it may be relatively narrow. <clears throat> it may be to do with a US, uh, a Chinese agreed purchasing order for US goods, particularly agricultural goods. It may be to do with uh, new arrangements for the protection of intellectual property. It may be to do with uh, future arrangements for the management of uh, future currency fluctuations involving the RMB. It may go beyond that. But um, if I'm a betting man, which I'm not, I would say it is odds on we're going to have such a deal done either by Thanksgiving or before the end of the year. And that's because both governments, as we got 18 years, 18 years, 18 months into the uh, trade dispute becoming the trade war, concluded that if this thing was allowed to roll on, it would be mutually deeply damaging. The mutual interests alive in ensuring that a satisfactory outcome could be reached uh, was such that it was agreed politically that this dispute had to be brought to a truce. I'm not here standing before you in a Pollyanna-ish sort of way saying it's all therefore fixed. It's not. The outstanding issues, intellectual property protection, extending issues in forced technology transfer, the outstanding issues in market access, the outstanding issues in state subsidy for uh, Chinese firms operating international marketplace, some of them, these remain on the table, as do the Chinese outstanding concerns about the pace, schedule and withdrawal of existing imposed US tariffs. These are difficult. And a large slice of what I've just described will go into phase two negotiations to be conducted next year. But my overall thesis to you today is that both these countries got to the edge, looked over the edge about a month or so ago, and reached a strategic decision. And that strategic decision was not to jump into the ravine. And that strategic decision was a full-blown trade war with tariffs on everything was so mutually destructive that it should not be sustained. That's where we've got up to. Agreeing to do no further damage is important. Agreeing on a phase one deal is also important. Agreeing on a phase two deal will be difficult and when it's done, important as well. But the seminal message for today is that against those who have been urging a more fundamental decoupling of the two economies, uh, frankly, the two countries' leaders have decided to take this now in a different direction. Let me touch briefly on foreign direct investment. If you look at the foreign inv direct investment flows between the two countries, historically, these have not been huge in number. And I simply use that compared with foreign investment flows even between the United States and Australia uh, or uh, other countries across the OECD or beyond the OECD. They've been significant, they've been useful, but not decisive in the overall economic relationship. Until the trade war hit, uh, US uh, foreign direct investment flows into uh, China uh, was running at about 13, 14, 15 billion dollars a year. The stock of US investment in China running at about 250 billion. Um, and by and large, that's where it stayed. No large exit of US investment capital so far. On the Chinese side, there has been some. The total stock of Chinese foreign direct investment in the United States is probably about 170 billion dollars. The flow, which was running also at about 13, 14, 15 billion dollars a year, has slowed right down to two or three. But we'd be wrong analytically to conclude that's purely as a response to what's happening with the tightening of CFIUS regulations or the tightening of other regulatory constraints around investment decisions alone. Because if you're mindful of and a student of Chinese domestic economic policy decisions, the deleveraging campaign, the particular instructions given to various Chinese firms not to expose themselves uh, too significantly in their foreign acquisitions process backed up by debt, uh, 
But in fact, the bulk of this uh, contraction of foreign investment activity in the United States has been driven by other considerations on the Chinese home front, not physical constraints uh, erected by the US CFIUS and related processes. Those changes in the regulatory environment do exist, and they are highly relevant to the technology sector, which I'll go on to now. But on the FDI front, all I'm saying is foreign direct investment, it's a mixed picture. And frankly, it would be wrong to say that the contraction in Chinese investment flows here is purely a product of the changing geopolitical environment. That's not the case. So thirdly, let's go to technology itself. And here we are, Silicon Valley. Here we are at Palo Alto. And here we are at Tencent. China has embarked upon a national high-tech strategy. We're all familiar with this, China 2025. We're also familiar with uh, what China seeks to do in achieving its own national self-reliance in multiple high technology categories. Um, And as we move towards mid-century, a dominant place in in high tech markets around the world. Charter identifies these new technology sectors, including artificial intelligence, as being the determinants of future economic competitiveness and success around the world. Read the documents. That's what it says. On artificial intelligence itself, uh, if you read the State Council decision of April 2017 in China, it's clearly articulated as meaning that China intends uh, to uh, accelerate its own national investments across all categories of artificial intelligence and what they see as a unique opportunity to be not just a market leader but an early adapter and therefore ultimately having a more than significant place in the global market. That's the stated direction of Chinese policy. And you see a large allocation of China's national science and research effort being directed against those high technology and AI in particular policy objectives. But what's the reality on the ground? It's more complex. It's more complex than that. When it comes to uh, areas such as uh, computer chips, well... China has some comparative advantage in certain categories, but not in others. When it comes to semiconductors, China perhaps is the source of 5% of global supply. This country, the United States, well in excess of 50% of global supply. And supercomputing technology in this country, I'm sorry, semiconductor technology in this country is judged by the industry, and it's not my field, to be five years in advance of what is happening in China in the semiconductor space. The reason I mention these is simply to illustrate the point that China's stated strategic direction in high technology and artificial intelligence is one thing. The -the on-the-ground reality, competitive reality, is different um, and more challenging. On the flip side of that, if we go to the future of mobile telephony and fifth-generation technology, I think we have someone here from Huawei. I heard met someone before. G'day, mate. How are you? The... um, (coughs) then we're all familiar with the Huawei debate. But the bottom line is, in terms of 5G technology, supporting systems, supporting infrastructure, uh, mobile relay stations around China and prospectively in other parts of the world, or currently being rolled out in various other parts of the world, uh, it's way in advance of what else is on offer, either from this country or elsewhere, whether it's from Ericsson or Nokia or whomever else. So my point is, whether it's on... Uh, Next generation mobile telephony, which is an an essential platform for the future Internet of Things, whether it is the supports for artificial intelligence uh, adaptations and applications in the future more generally, including the underpinning technologies of computer chips as well as uh, as, uh, semiconductors, It is a mixed picture in terms of US and Chinese competitiveness, and there are high levels of, shall we say, mutual uh, interdependence. But the reality is, because this is so central to each country's national economic strategy and national security strategies, that we are going to look at some levels of constriction, some levels of constraint, and some levels of decoupling uh, within the technology space. We would be wrong to conclude that this will be comprehensive. It will be, in my judgment, quite technology-specific and within particular technologies, product-specific. But to conclude that technology itself represents one giant decoupling trajectory is, again, analytically flawed. 
it's infinitely more complex than that. When you go to the granularity of mobile telephony, go to the granularity of what's unfolding uh, with uh, uh, computer chips and semiconductors and the granularity of what's unfolding with supercomputers. Two concluding points. I've talked so far about trade, FDI and tech. What about capital markets? Uh, we often think that the US-China trade relationship is big, and it is. It's half a trillion bucks. $350 billion worth of Chinese exports, $150 billion worth of American exports. That's not a piece of loose change. The quantum of the direct uh, finance engagement between the two economies, the two countries' capital markets, if you put all categories of equity markets, debt markets, as well as the holdings of cross-border finance and loans, as well as the holding of treasuries, US treasuries by China's um, central uh, financial institutions, including SAFE, the aggregate figures for the US-China financial relationship, all categories considered, is in the order of about 5.1 trillion. That's quite a lot of cash. And when I look at the depth and the breadth of this uh, financial relationship, it is of an order of magnitude whereby the forces, as it were, seeking to further integrate the two countries' capital markets are much stronger than those trying to rip them apart. Let me explain that one step further. China, uh, because of the evolution of its economy, <coughs> Uh, its rising living standards, its burgeoning levels of domestic consumption. Uh, China, for the first time in a quarter of a century, this year is likely to generate a current account deficit. China, therefore, for the first time, is going to have a net international financing requirement. China, therefore, needs to be in the business of further liberalising its own capital markets, not going in the reverse direction. And that's exactly what China has been doing. Look at the recent decisions on liberalisation of equities markets, of debt markets, removing the caps on various foreign firms in the insurance sector, brokerage sector, other financial services industry participants. As we know, our Chinese friends are smart. They know what they're doing. And that's why they're doing it. Now, what I see instead in Washington is uh, Rubio, for example, advancing what he describes as the Equitable Act, um, which is a draft uh, piece of legislation in the United States Senate aimed at delisting Chinese firms currently listed on the New York Stock Exchange and other exchanges here in this country if, in the US regulator's judgment, those listings do not conform with uh, American accounting standards. Uh, if that was the case, you're going to see a couple of trillion dollars worth of delistings, not a small consideration. What I note with interest, however, is that the level of enthusiasm for the Rubio bill, the Equitable Act, so described, um, seems to be faltering, as those in Washington discover that those in the United States finance industry actually rather like uh, and support the comprehensive nature of engagement between the two countries' capital markets. And similarly, with the other proposal we see kicking around Washington at present in terms of possible instructions to US public pension funds to not invest in particular Chinese firms deemed to be a, uh, unacceptable from US human rights and other standards. Again, I don't see a groundswell of support for that particular proposal, at least as yet. But my overall thesis to you is on capital markets, given its quantum, Given China's domestic need in terms of its net international financing requirements, given the liberalisations of the last year or two of what it's doing vis-a-vis -vis, uh, its own domestic capital market liberalisations, both debt and equity markets, um, I think this is a much more open field and non-decoupling field uh, than the propagandists of decoupling would have us believe. Given the length of time I've now spoken, let me just conclude with this. I've touched on trade and the fact that, yes, we've had some decoupling there because of the tariff war between the two countries, but I think they're in the process of declaring a significant truce. And that's because mutually assured economic destruction is not a good idea. Secondly, foreign direct investment, as I said, the arteries are at least still open in one direction, 
And the fact that they've slowed from China to the United States is open to a range of other interpretations beyond the, the regulatory changes in Washington. Technology will be a mixed picture depending on what category of tech we're looking at. I've been talking about ICT and biotechnology so far. I do not see uh, imminent large-scale restrictions on continued collaboration biotech between the two countries, though they may come. And on capital markets more broadly, can I say that the overwhelming mutual interest is for this level of, as it were, condominium between the two countries to continue. In the Q&A, we can talk about currency. In the Q&A, we can talk about talent as well. Let me just conclude on talent and people um, before we go to the discussion. I look with some concern at actions taken recently by both governments to begin to restrict the easy flow of people in both directions. Uh, that would be the most disastrous decoupling of all, given that us folks, people, women and men, we actually make the decisions in capital markets, in technology markets, in foreign investments, uh, and in trade in goods and services. And if you start putting huge restrictions on people moving in each direction, then I think we start to have a problem. One uneasy barometer for me is to look at what's happened in terms of the rejection rate for Chinese government uh, scholarship-sponsored students coming to the United States in the last two years. A 13% reduction this year, following a 3% reduction the previous year. It's the first time we've ever had year-on-year -year reductions. Since uh, Chinese uh, government-sponsored students first started coming to this country many decades ago. That I think we should be concerned about. We should be concerned about the fact that the overall international student uh, caseload uh, in American universities in the last 12 months has started to go down as well. I'm not an American. I'm an Australian and I'm here at the, uh, as a guest of your government. But if I was to make one simple suggestion from the outside as a, as a friend of this country, but also as a friend of, the, of, uh, of China, it would be very bad for any country like the United States and my own country, Australia, to start closing doors. As soon as we start imposing onerous visa restrictions on students, on researchers, on academics and the rest, uh, or on the researchers and think tankers and others like them, then I think it's the thin edge of the wedge in terms of where all that could go longer term. I'm a practitioner. I understand that there are always going to be national security requirements. There's always going to be review by the Chinese security and intelligence services of incoming applicants to visit China. That's normal. In grown-up land, that's what happens. It's just life. Guess what? It happens in our countries too. That's life too. But I think that these uh, remarkably sophisticated intelligence and security establishments can handle this challenge without closing the door. And that is what I'm most concerned about in all this discussion of decoupling. So rather than perpetuating what I describe as an indisciplined and unhelpful generic debate that either decoupling across the board is happening in all these categories, when in fact it's not, it's a much more mixed picture than that, or furthermore, the Bannon view of the world that decoupling is desirable, even if it's not currently the descriptive reality, my argument to you is that were those propositions to succeed, we end up in an environment where, in fact, you recreate one of the preconditions, one of the conditions precedent for a second Cold War. Remember what I said about the Soviet Union the United States in the last Cold War? One of its dis distinguishing characteristics was that they had no economic engagement whatsoever. Pure, hard politics and ideology. That's not been the case with China and America for 40 years. Why start now? Thank you. So we'd like to have a discussion. We'd like you to uh, pose questions and give Kevin a chance to answer them. While you're warming up, I happen to write down just a couple of questions of my own to give you uh, some time to think about yours. So, Kevin, my first question would be, 
I'm going to be going to uh, Shanghai this weekend. I go several times a year. I'm anticipating that so many of the people that I talk with will pose this question simply because they do every time I go. And that is, um, they believe, I think, that most Americans are worried about the, the Thucydides trap and that they're worried about China's rise. And my contention would be that most Americans can't even pronounce the word Thucydides, <laughs> including me. But what do you think about that? You're, you're Australian, you're a guest in this country, as you say, but you know an awful lot of people. What do you think the American attitude toward China is today, to the extent that there is one? Or maybe you can divide it into categories. I'm not trying to. Oops. Here, you push this up. There you go. Good. Advanced American technology. Turn the button on. The, um, um, when you look at the United States and the emerging attitudes towards China, it's a bit like this. The official Washington, let's start with that, both Republican and Democrat, uh, had the following view. That um, we Americans gave China the benefit of the doubt, even when we thought their economy was more Marxist than market. We encouraged, facilitated, and made possible China's entry to the World Trade Organization 2002. Through that, we opened ourselves and global markets to China uh, in order to make possible China's uh, export-driven growth model of the last 20 years. Um, and we did that all on the basis of an explicit and implicit assumption uh, that uh, China would fully embrace and adopt and adapt to uh, WTO rules. And on top of that, let's call it Bob Zellickism, that as a consequence of that, that China would become, quote, a responsible global stakeholder in the liberal international order. And the final piece of logic is this, that... Uh, if and when China became a larger economy than the United States, that uh, China would sustain that liberal international order in China's own interest because China will have conformed already to it. That's the logic. Uh, if you uh, deal with the Washington establishment. I think uh, part of the problem with the logic, uh, Ken, is simply that Perhaps they didn't ask the Chinese about it um, because it's a more complex reality. Um, uh, I knew Zhu Rongji very well when he was Premier of China. Uh, I understood what was done through the Zhu Rongji and uh, Jiang Zemin period. I saw what was continued under uh, Hu Jintao and um, Wen Jiaobao uh, and what continues today. But China has never explicitly or implicitly uh, indicated it was about to depart from Marxism-Leninism. That's just the truth of it. People might find that uncomfortable, but that's just the reality. And so if I was trying to um, say, where has all this come unstuck? It's kind of like two ships passing each other in the night uh, with a series of explicit and implicit American assumptions about what China would do, including one day becoming a liberal democracy. Uh, that was the end point of the expectation. While China is a Marxist-Leninist state, albeit with a mixed economy, or what the Chinese would describe as, you know, your um, and uh, so socialism, the Chinese characteristics, sailing in a somewhat different direction. So I think we've had a massive case of mutual non-expectation satisfaction underneath everything else before we go to the individual illustrations of this thing. And the problem for all of us, uh, Ken, and engaged in the business of practical diplomacy, 
uh, or official diplomacy or unofficial diplomacy is um, is that people then get quite angry. <laughs> what I've just described or gives rise in America to senses of um, being misled, to being betrayed. And our Chinese friends um, will say, it's our country, um, we're a sovereign political system, how dare you tell us what to do? And therefore, this has in recent times plumbed not just rational depths, but emotional depths as well. Apart from all that, it's going fine. Thank you. I have a second question while we're waiting for you to get fully warmed up. And that is, uh, Kevin... God, they're a quiet audience. I think it's great. (laughs) If if you don't mind pretending for a minute, pretend that you were um, either a marriage counselor or a a mediator. My God. uh, (laughs) China and the U.S. came to you and said... We're just, our relationship is not working out. Hmm. We need help. Well, given that most mediators don't fully blame things on one side or the other, what would be the two or three pieces of advice you would give to each of the two partners here? (laughs) Just want to get the hell out of here. (laughs) The... um, the, uh, I once, in answer to a question like this, Ken said, "But what was one shiga, disandro?" And what I meant was disan um, So it's hard to think of yourself as a third party, but I didn't realise that disandro meant actually the third person involved in a relationship. <laughs> no, no, that, that's in not a, what we're after. In, yeah. a, in, in a tricky sort of way. So, so we'll leave the disandro problems over mm-hmm. here for the time being. The um, Look, it's very easy for people like me who come from a smaller country but who knows uh, both countries reasonably well to provide, you know, sage advice. It's very easy to do that because uh, it's not me, okay? I'm not Chinese, I'm not American. I can begin to understand how both countries and cultures and capitals think but still not me. I think um, the, the one core... Um, principle uh, that I would recommend to the Chinese side of this marriage, this uneasy marriage, um, this uneasy relationship, <clears throat> um, uh, would be for the Chinese not to assume that the Americans are not just driven by comprehensive hypocrisy. <clears throat> Uh, when I um, sit down and listen to all my Chinese friends in Beijing and I have lots of discussions there, the constant refrain is, bloody Americans, there they go again. They say one thing, they do the other. It's just all because <coughs> they want to overturn our political system. It's not as simple as that at all. Um, in fact, it's much more complex. And my experience of Americans is that while sometimes you guys do overreach in terms of being the light on the hill... Um, and uh, all of that sort of thing, um, is that Americans are fundamentally very good people. And this, the idealism of this country is, um, is, uh, is something which inspires the rest of the world. So my counsel to the, Ameri- to the Chinese side of this union would be not to simply assume that, uh, that the United States is just being two-faced because they are two-faced. It's not that. You can have a disagreement with American policy. It doesn't mean that uh, American idealism is not keenly and genuinely felt and believed. On the flip side, Mm. what I'd say is that our American friends um, uh, would be worthwhile looking at the relationship with China uh, with a greater degree of basic respect. Respect in any relationship is important. But when you're accustomed for 100 years for being number one in the world, which you have been, the United States ever since you kicked the Brits to one side, which we supported, that is, kicking the Brits to one side, the, um, uh, you know, there's no one been really around to challenge you. And so consciously or subconsciously, um, there is often an American approach which is either my way or the highway. You either do what I say or goodbye. 
Now, uh, my counsel to my American friends would be, whether you're dealing with a smaller country like, say, Australia, or a larger country uh, like China, uh, it, is, it is deeply important to exhibit not just courtesy and respect, but an understanding, uh, frankly, of why other countries think the way they think without just assuming that they are wrong. Um, those two things, which is, uh, I think, uh, important for each side of this uh, fractious relationship, won't solve everything, but it might get you down to, let's call it an open table for dialogue and discussion about the substantive things which separate you. At present, we often get don't even get to the table because we're carrying to the table a whole bunch of prior assumptions about either American hypocrisy on the one hand or um, a lack of respect as perceived by the Chinese on the other. That was a good answer. I think there's a career for you in mediation. Uh, let's do George first. Maybe. And then... very comprehensive rational analysis of the U.S.-China relations. Unfortunately, the swamp as we know it, it's really a very bipartisan, anti-China attitude. No politicians from either party would consider speaking in a moderate, reasonable, rational way because that's against their political interests. Um, and, and that's true for leaders on both parties. So is there a way to skip all the complexities in trying to explain the subtleties and simply get to the bottom line and point out to the American politicians and the American people that where this is going right now is a deeply lose-lose proposition and it's going to hurt the American public to an extent that they probably don't understand and appreciate? Hmm. Look, I think there are hawks in both countries. There are hawks in China who um, choose to see Amer America negatively, um, whatever the circumstances. And I know them. I met them. I've seminared with them uh, in Beijing. And they're the reverse, which is uh, American China hawks, Democrat and Republican. Um, and there are lots of them. Uh, and I know them too. But you know what I find in both countries? There are a bunch of pretty reasonable people as well. They just want to, frankly, make this relationship work. These are two fantastic countries. Let me say that as someone who is not an American and not a Chinese. This country, United States, is a country of phenomenal achievement in the so much of which you should be proud. I mean, the American Revolution, what an extraordinary story. I mean, how you did what you did to become who you've become. The fact that you've uh, emerged uh, in the 20th century, you know, saving Europe from itself um, because of the conflagrations of the Second World War um, and being the central force in the defeat of Japanese fascism um, in, in Asia. I mean, this was extraordinary. And then to have fashioned this open economy, which um, in its history has welcomed people from everywhere into this multi-ethnic country called the United States, this is quite remarkable, quite remarkable. As I say to my Chinese friends, often to their complete horror, against the measure of superpowers in global history, America's not bad. It hasn't gone out there and tried to colonise everybody. They could have for the last 75 years. They had enough power to do it, but they didn't. Chose not to. There was a bit of a frolic with the Philippines under Teddy Roosevelt. Um, a little bit of a frolic and let's call it the Monroe Doctrine. Um, but by and large, you didn't do what the British did, you didn't do what the French did, you didn't do what the Spanish did, you didn't do what the Portuguese did, um, etc. Look what the Russians did to China, for God's sake. You know, whoom, there it goes. Uh, Peter the Great right through to Vladivostok. America didn't do that. Um, and, you know, the Mexicans will have a different take on that in terms of uh, what happened. Uh, but in terms of a global colonial empire, which the Europeans modelled, you guys didn't do that. Now look at China. China's uh, territorial boundaries are largely settled in the High Qing Dynasty. Basically, if you look at the map of China at the time of Kangxi and uh, Qianlong, the difference between those maps and today's maps are not large. And so has China had an interest in creating, you know, a global, as it were, uh, colonial civilization? No. Because you know as well as I do, you're Chinese. 
its overwhelming preoccupation is with, uh, with Hanzu, you know, the, the Han people. And as a consequence of that, I mean, these extraordinary civilizational achievements domestically within China, both in science and the arts and aesthetics, um, and extraordinary wealthy economies in the Tang and the Song, you know, these are remarkable achievements. So when I look at these two extraordinary civilizations, these guys, the Americans, currently being, if you like, the inheritors of the West, and you guys, uh, in terms of what's emerged in greater China over several millennia, this is quite a remarkable story. So what I say is that when I look at interlocutors in both capitals and try to remind them of the strengths and virtues of each other's country, there should be a way through this because the thing about both your countries and both your people is you're highly intelligent, highly intelligent. Um, and, um, and therefore there is no need to repeat all that crazy European history of blowing each other's brains out uh, in order to obtain dominance. We should learn from European mistakes and uh, not repeat them. So uh, my final point in answer to your question more directly is when I look at what's happening with the current debate in DC about capital markets, and I referred to it in my earlier remarks before, despite all the public histrionics about uh, the US-China relationship, I don't see a majority flocking to the floor in support of the Rubio bill. Why? Because I don't think they want that level of decoupling to happen. There's a difference between the language which is being used and the reality of that's been reflected. And I see uh, in China a whole bunch of people trying to restabilize this relationship as well. and uh, uh, um, more strategic and economic outreach to the rest of the world outside of the U.S. and the impact on the U.S.-China relationships? Yeah, uh, look, I think China has changed its trajectory under Xi Jinping, <laughs> Xi Dada. <laughs> and, um, and that is, um, uh, for those of you who study Chinese foreign policy, there's a really important conference in Beijing in about November of 2014, the Foreign Policy Work Conference of the Party Centre, Dang Zhongyang, the Nega Wai Shi Gong Zhu Hui Yi. If you look at that five years ago, and you look at the, um, the pattern of, shall we say, Chinese foreign policy, diplomatic, international economic policy, self confidence, and asserting Chinese positions in a way which we weren't familiar with prior to then. That is when the change happened. Now, I wasn't invited to that conference. Um, in fact, we've never seen the full text of Xi Jinping's speech. We've seen a Renmin Rabao and Xinhua report of the speech. But basically, that's where you see the end of the formal end of the um, uh, previous uh, orthodoxy going back 30 years of Deng Xiaoping of Taoguang Yang Hui Jue Bodang Tong, which is hide your strength, bide your time, never take the lead. Um, Xi Dada came along and said, OK, that was useful for then. Now we've got a new set of realities. China's become a dark war. China's a big country now. So it sounds like frogs in the room. The, um, <laughs> the, uh, it's OK. It reminds me back home in Australia. The, um, I'm from Queensland, which is kind of like Florida. It's tropical, lots of frogs and things. And other things that bite you, by the way. The... Um, um, and so what Xi Jinping said, that worked then, but actually China has a whole bunch of uh, new equities to prosecute in the international space. So when we in the collective West encounter this new, uh, let's call it more confident and self-assertive China, um, that's because China has changed. China's interests and values haven't changed. They've been constant. But China's wai jiao de zuo fa has changed. It's, it's diplomatic method. Um, and so that's why we're seeing a, a new reality, and that's why I think people are uh, somewhat unaccustomed to, um, to that being the case. But if you want to know how, where it came from and when it came uh, from... What's, what, what, what's the U.S. going to have? What's, what, what's the U.S. going to respond to? Tell us oh, U.S. strategy and response. That's a separate question altogether. Um, Look, the United States, um, uh, if you look carefully at what's emerged since the US national security strategy of um, November, December 2017, the US defense strategy of early 2018, 
statements just recently by Secretary of State Pompeo uh, last week and Vice President Pence. If you put all those things together, what I see is this. <clears throat> I see an American attitude about China, but not a strategy for dealing with China. Uh, and when I look at those texts, these are texts which sort of drip with anger rather than what I describe as a necessarily coherent strategy for dealing with a newly self-confident and assertive China. Now, if you look at Pompeo's speech of a week ago, Pompeo has said we're still working on this, um, to quote him directly, on the tactics and strategy which will give effect to the objectives which I, Pompeo, put into this speech. But it's still at very much a work in progress. The really hard part of Pompeo's speech uh, uh, is effectively him saying that the fundamental um, interests of the Chinese Communist Party are incompatible with American interests and values. Now, he stops short of using the language of regime change, but I've not heard that language from an American Secretary of State or President of the United States in nearly half a century. Uh, that is sobering for me. from this side here. Yes, please. <coughs> this woman right here. Yes. Hi, I'm Alice Han from the Hoover Institution, also Australian. Oh, good day. Um, How are you? Hi, I'm well, thanks. Um, I thank you, Prime Minister Rudd, for your comments and um, contributions to US-China and Australia-China relations. Um, I have a question about cyber governance. I think when you talk to policymakers in Brussels, um, Canberra, or even Washington, there's a lot of concern about uh, Chinese tech companies uh, and the cyber governance model that Beijing, quote unquote, seems to be exporting uh, as, as pursuant to the 2017 cybersecurity law. Um, how do you think Chinese uh, policymakers and tech companies can assuage those fears when they continue exporting their products in the, in the minds of foreign countries about uh, their citizens' data being sent back to China and the risks um, related to that? Thank you. I'm conscious of the fact of what I actually don't know about cyber. So, and I'm also five years outside of the intelligence loop <coughs> since I left office. So I'm very mindful of what I'm unaware of. Uh, I can recall where things stood when I left office five years ago. So I'm therefore cautious in my response to you. Two things, though, um, come to mind which I think are relevant. So far, my observation is um, both the United States and China at the level of states have been deeply cautious, profoundly cautious, about unleashing any cyber, cyber capability against other their other state apparatus or the state apparatus or institutions of each other. And so, and that's because there's a deep realisation in mature national security policy establishments in Beijing and Washington that cyber attacks at scale against the civilian infrastructure or the political establishment, both sides, uh, aim to disable actually constitutes a new weapon of mass destruction. So what I do observe, uh, in the absence of any formal protocols, governing uh, cyber relations between the two countries, that there is a de facto observance uh, of the fact that this would be profoundly unwise. Now, that level of wisdom is not reflected in what those crazy people in North Korea do. <coughs> um, and uh, the North Koreans exhibit no such restraint uh, in their, uh, shall we say, predisposition to deploy cyber capabilities against uh, other states and state-related entities. In the private sector, I'll simply say this. In the private sector, it is <clears throat> critical that states agree rapidly on an effective governance regime between them uh, so that all um, uh, corporations and individuals can have confidence of the security of their data. That regime does not exist at present. And until it does, then we are frankly marching in a very uncertain and unpredictable direction where individual citizens and corporations around the world uh, have a basis for being genuinely concerned. But we don't have a regulatory regime to deal with it 
and there's no process underway at present bilaterally between the United States and China, let alone an effective one multilaterally, even though there's an attempt at one multilaterally, to reach that uh, end point. Thank you very much for an extraordinarily stimulating and an informative pre presentation. I really appreciate that. If I may summarize it, perhaps a bit crudely, I would say that you are cautiously optimistic. And I would add to that within the frame that you've been given to fill today, focused very much on the economic side. So two contingencies occur to me that I'd like to just put, put to you, if I may. Uh, the first is the possible implications of economic decline, if that's not too strong a term, in China, how that would impact the relationship. Would it improve it? Would it make it worse? And second, going back to the pure, hard politics and ideology that you talked about earlier, which is clearly a dramatic difference between whatever we're into now and the Cold War that we knew with the Soviet Union. Nevertheless, how would Chinese behavior precisely in that zone, which was not part of your lecture, so feel free to pass on this. I'm thinking of Xinjiang. I'm thinking of Hong Kong and what could happen in Hong Kong. I'm thinking of the South China Sea. I'm thinking of Taiwan. Is it possible that Chinese behavior between now and November of next year, given the rising temperature doing a prolonged political campaign, could turn you into an incautious pessimist? Well, uh, in politics and international relations, I've always chosen to be a professional optimist. Um, and the reason is actually rational. And that is, um, the world is full of people who will give you a thousand reasons why it's all about to implode. Um, and then you just go home depressed. Um, uh, or uh, you can choose to apply that formidable intellectual capacity to thinking about one, two or three ways through. And I think there are one, two or three ways through this particular difficulty of this relationship rather than marriage counselors saying you should really just feel better about each other. Um, um, and, uh, <clears throat> and in fact, I mean, some of the work that I've been doing since I came to this country, including at Harvard and the Kennedy School, on what I call as constructive realism, what I call managed strategic competition between these two countries, and how you'd establish uh, uh, parameters around which, or within which, uh, competitive and even confrontational relationships can be managed without escalating into conflict, uh, let alone war. So I think there is a way through this. Um, uh, and it, for me, is uh, problematic when too much of the energies of the American or Chinese commentariat and think tank land goes into simple description of how bad things are getting, rather than, as I've sought to do today, present you with some data which says it ain't that bad, and secondly, to point to, frankly, ways through this. And I think there are. Uh, on the other part of your question, which is, let's call it um, non-economic decoupling, if I'm giving it this a crude descriptor. Um, the truth is um, that given the changing balance of power between the United States and China, as China's power increases against most of the aggregates of power, um, strategic power, military power, um, economic power, technology power, etc. Um, that the dynamics, overall dynamics of the relationship will therefore change and become more competitive. That's where I think Graham Allison has an insight, but not a solution. He has an insight as to what's happening, but not a solution for dealing with it. So on the predictive side, uh, what you've partly indicated, um, I think, uh, is uh, realistic. However economic decoupling is managed, and I've suggested it will be a much more mixed reality than the bannons of this world aspire for or aspire to, on the political and foreign policy and national security dimensions of the US-China relationship, it is likely to become rockier. <laughs> Taiwan will be uh, a growing problem. Tsai Ing-wen, the current president of Taiwan, is likely to be re-elected. And this will lead to a further hardening in the relationship uh, between Taipei and uh, Beijing. That election's in March, I think, from memory. 
Um, Hong Kong we're familiar with. People watch it on a continuing basis. Xinjiang people are familiar with. We watch that on a continuing basis. South China Sea, largely invisible to the international community, but a lot of activity unfolding there. And the wider geostrategic competition between China and the United States in the wider Indo-Pacific region, including other regions of the world where it's beginning to become clearer, including Southeast Asia where Australia is. And so the real challenge is these um, geopolitical tensions are going to become sharper and more real uh, than they have been in the past. And so I go back to the proposition I advanced before. You can either therefore throw further fuel on that fire by accelerating economic decoupling or uh, you can in fact help militate against any one of those security related problems blowing up completely by ensuring that you continue to have massive mutual economic equities uh, in each other's country. That would be my response to your question, sir. We've actually run out of time. And so I'm going to just spend the next 20 seconds wrapping it up, as they say. First of all, I want to thank all of you for coming today. It, it's wonderful to have such a high quality audience with us. And then secondly, I want to thank uh, Kevin for his contribution. I would say that uh, most human beings, including myself, think that we are fair and balanced, think that we're in the middle of the spectrum. But I have to concede, uh, okay, Kevin may be of all of the people that study the U.S.-China relationship that I know, the, the most fair, the most balanced, and the person whose views are closest to the center of the spectrum. So, Kevin, thank you very much for joining us today.